Good morning. We'll give everyone just a couple more minutes to get in here. We are excited this morning. We're going to be joined by a dynamic group of, um, of our friends and presenters from over at Cooter Journey. And also, we're going to have our good friends from right there at Dante's VES. But before we get going, let me just first of all say good morning and thank everybody for taking time out of your day for this outstanding professional development opportunity. Um, this morning, we are going to be exploring Holland Codes, the use of Holland Codes with our good friend, a team from over at Cooter. Good morning, Miss Elizabeth Moore. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Yes. And also along with Elizabeth, we have Miss Paige McDonough from Cooter as well. We'd like to welcome her. Thank you. Hi, yes, everyone. and Paige, we just want you to know, <laughs> yes, this is your first time with us, but we want you to know you're in good company. Um, Paige's brother is a member of the Armed Forces Active Duty member, um, Go Army. So you're in good company. You're going to find all your best friends in this audience. Wonderful. So, um, honored to be here. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, everyone get comfortable. Um, I'm not going to belabor this intro for too long, but you know how we do things around Dante's. If you want to jump in and say something, please raise your hands. This is an interactive training. We're here for you. You can ask questions directly to the presenters or to your colleagues in the chat, even if you want to, and we can collaborate on some answers. Um, but uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Elizabeth and Paige, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Mariba. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for joining us um, and taking time out of your busy schedule. Appreciate you guys being here, Mariba. Thank you for hosting us. And Aaron and Emily with the Dante's team, thanks as always. You guys are just incredible to work with and we're so appreciative. Um, on your screen, you're seeing a sample username and password we're going to be using a variety of, of materials and tools during the session today, but this is one um, piece that you're welcome to put in your toolkit. It is a sample login to the Dante system. I know a lot of counselors do have their own sample student accounts, but in the event that you don't have one or you're trying to remember where that password went, um, this is one that you're welcome to use both today or even after the session. So. Uh, service member one is the username and the password is service. And again, this is a sample uh, service member account um, where you will see exactly what service members will be seeing. Okay. All right. So that's posted in the chat as well. I'm going to take that slide down, but it's also posted in the chat. So this morning we're talking through using Holland codes with service members. Um, from our Cooter team, I'm joined by Paige McDonough. Uh, Paige, you would take a moment and say hello. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. As mentioned already, I come from a long line of um, both former and active service members. Um, so it's really such a privilege to be here with you all today. And I just want to thank everyone for the incredible work that you do. Um, really, really important work and just very humbled that we at Cooter get to be able to support you in those endeavors. So looking forward to being here with you today. 100%. Thank you, Paige. And um, it's so nice to be with you guys. I've met uh, several of you in prior webinars. Um, and for those of you that I'm just meeting this morning, my name is Elizabeth. I have been with the Cooter team for about nine years now. I was in the classroom before I came over to start working with Cooter. And I worked with um, students and adults utilizing uh, the Cooter platform. Um, I'm located in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm a Huntsville native and not far from Redstone Arsenal. We hear the, the testing booms on a daily basis uh, with all the things that they're doing at Redstone, but it's really nice to be with you guys. And, and again, just to echo Paige, we are so honored to be a partner of Dante's and uh, to work with you all all over the world. Um, we have a number of people on our team who are working to support you every day. So anytime you have questions, if you have service members with questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team um, Paige, if you don't mind, will you throw in the chat our support contact information? When we uh, share that we really do want to connect with you guys, we mean it. So please don't hesitate to reach out to our team anytime you've got questions. Um, so our partnership with Dante's 
um, allows us to provide the, Don the Cooter Journey platform. It does have custom content specifically for the US military. And if you're new to using the platform, um, I'm so glad that you're joining us this morning. For those of you who've been longtime users, there's so many great pieces. And when I was in uh, when I was using the system before I came to work for Cooter, I would always go back to training just because there were so many different pieces to learn. So I'm um, so glad you guys are here. So just as a quick reminder, or if you're seeing it for the first time, we've got everything from career assessments to resumes to e-profiles, all kinds of military resources. It's a, it's a vast system. So um, please uh, take some time, dig through it, uh, just go explore. You're not going to break it. Um, so spend some time in that sample service member account and you can learn everything that it has to offer. All right, so our agenda this morning, we are digging into Holland's work. So this is based on the work of John Holland. Um, we're gonna be talking through client, uh, Holland types, excuse me. And then we're gonna talk through applying those codes into working with service members and in those counseling conversations as well as some next steps. So that's our agenda for this morning. If there's anything else that you guys were hopeful that we would cover, feel free to throw that in the chat, You know, let us know. And if we can't work it in this morning, um, we can definitely work it into future webinars. So we always want to hear the, the uh, topics and the pieces that you guys want information on. This is, this is your time. So we want to make uh, the best use of your time. Um, all right. So let's jump right in. What are the Holland types? So for those of you who've been using the uh, Cooter system for a while now, um, we have the six different Holland types. These are based on Holland's theory of vocational choice. Um, Emily, if you don't mind, if you'll post our first polling question. Um, so if you'll take a second and answer that polling question as it pops up. Um, oh, let me go back for just a second. I mean to hit that. But uh, if you'll post the first polling question, thank you, ma'am. Um, if you have worked with Holland before, just would like to kind of get a gauge of who's familiar with Holland or if this is new, um, or if you're thinking, I'm not sure, Elizabeth, maybe it's been a minute, that's fine too. So we have six different Holland types. Um, Holland's theory of vocational choice um, goes back a long ways. It was first developed in 1959, and it actually took into consideration the work of uh, Dr. Frederick Cooter, who we'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. But with the six types, we've got um, basically six big buckets. And so when we talk through these six different personalities, which we're gonna do in just a second, uh, service members can start to identify with specific buckets as they're thinking through their future. So John Holland, um, he developed the theory of vocational choice. This is a picture of Dr. Holland. And with this, um, he actually utilized the Cooter interest preference, which was first developed for the US military in 1938. And so with the work of John Holland, um, we are exploring uh, individuals' personalities and then matching them to work environments based on those same personalities. So we're looking for what we call good fit. So a good fit between an individual's career personality and the work environment that they're going into. And what we know about good fit is it leads to, it's more likely to lead to satisfaction in a career choice. So I think it was kind of those four steps, the individual's personality, the personality of the work environment, establishing a good fit, and then aiming towards satisfaction. So looking at our polling, um, our poll really quick, it looks like the majority of folks on the call this morning have utilized Holland codes before, um, but we do have a handful of folks that have not, or are, this is completely brand new information. So thanks for sharing, you guys. That's helpful to kind of know where everybody is. I'm going to share that really quick so you can take a peek and see where everybody is. All right. So when we talk through those six big buckets, um, we are going to be uh, looking at each of them in depth, but I'm going to throw a question out here. Based on the titles of the um, different Holland codes, Emily, if you'll post our, our third polling question, please. Based on the titles of the Holland codes, when you think about someone like Amanda Gorman, who's our US National Youth Poet Laureate, um, what would be your guess about which bucket she fits into? Um, you don't have to answer just yet, but I want you to kind of have that, mind, that question in your mind and it'll be posted on the poll as well. I'm gonna share our last poll. Um, let me go back for just a second. And when we think about Amanda Gorman, oh, hang on just a second, yeah. When we think about Amanda Gorman um, and you're listening to these different descriptors, think through which one you think she might be. Yeah. 
Um, let's see, do we have a question in the chat, Mariba, from Javanda? Um, no, ma'am. I'm sorry, I was just sending her a little private message. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, no worries, no worries. I just wanna make sure I didn't mess. All right, you guys. Um, and Thank that you. being said, oh yeah, absolutely. That being said, um, we'll keep an eye on the chat. And then if you guys have any questions, please ask your questions. Don't feel like you're interrupting. I, we are so much more interested in hearing what you have to say than anything we could share. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions, post in the uh, chat, unmute. We wanna hear from you guys, okay? All right, so let's look at the six different Holland types and we'll jump right into uh, which one Amanda might be. So the first one is realistic. Um, I think of these, if we're gonna go really stereotypical, I think of these as uh, one way to classify them as our Home Depot people, right? These are the doers. They get things done if you've seen that commercial. So realistic, but that's, that's very much a stereotype. Realistic is a much bigger bucket. So when we talk about realistic career personalities, these are our folks who are hands-on. They are very strong when it comes to athletic ability, when it comes to, oh, I'm sorry, you guys, my screen is jumping ahead. When it comes to um, electrical, mechanical skills, again, these are very hands-on people. They like to produce a product that's tangible at the end of the day. So I won a game, I built a building, I repaired an electrical outlet. They're very practical, they're down to earth people. Um, they get things done, they, they make stuff happen. So these are our realistic folks. When we talk about our investigative, and I'm gonna send you guys these slides so you'll have these as a resource. When we talk about our investigative people, um, another way to classify them would be our thinkers. Now, does that mean the other six, the other five buckets of career personalities aren't thinking? Absolutely not. It's just that that's really what one of their main um, uh, personality types is. They are thinking through and asking really great questions. So they have strong math and science ability. They are very curious people. They're very studious. Um, you might find these folks in a lab studying a problem. You might ask, you know, getting them, they might be asking questions about how our world works. These are the folks that I think about when they first looked at the sky and said, can we put a man on the moon? You know, so these are our thinkers, they're investigative and they're asking really great questions. Then we have our artistic bucket. These are our creators. Now it's really easy to look at the artistic bucket and go, oh, these are people who paint and draw, right? Yes, but also these are our communicators. These are folks who are really strong in language. They have really strong writing skills. They want to um, create something. They have a creative gift that needs to come out and it's gonna come out. So it's really important that they have space to be creative and they are not big on structure. They are very free thinkers and they don't love structure. That can feel very um, prohibitive to them. So based on our polling question, I'm gonna share the results. You guys did a great job. So if you guessed artistic, you were create, correct. So Amanda Gorman is artistic. Um, LeBron James. So when we think about people in the realistic bucket, LeBron's a great example because he has that athletic ability. Um, he is very hands-on. Um, LeBron is also an activist and of course a basketball legend. Um, when we look at Melinda Gates, she falls into our investigative bucket. She is asking questions. She's a philanthropist, a computer scientist, and again, has that math and science ability. Amanda, of course, is artistic with that creative piece, but again, it gets into communication and then having an outlet for that communication through her poetry. All right, so let's go to our next set of uh, Holland codes. All right, so uh, Emily, if you don't mind launching our next poll, um, which Holland Code do you think best describes the Honorable Ventress Gibson, the director of the U.S. Mint? Um, so you may not know much about the Honorable Ventress Gibson, but we're going to go through the next three Holland Codes. And so as you're listening, you can think through which one you think describes her. So Paige, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk through our next three codes. Thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. So the next one we're going to look at is social. So these are people who really like to help people. So they want to pursue a profession where they're able to support people, um, whether that's maybe teaching, counseling. Um, you don't mind just going back a slide? Thank you, no worries. Yes, I'm um, so sorry, you guys. My mouse is losing its mind, so let me go back. <laughs> perfect, thank Thanks, you. Babe. 
No worries. So I would suspect many of you would probably have a prominent S amongst your code and your work that you do with the servicemen um, is really providing that support and helping them. So when you're thinking about the different codes, uh, Elizabeth already went through realistic. This is sort of the opposite. So realistic is people who like to work with their hands and machines and tools. Social are people who like to work with other people. They tend to be very friendly, very helpful, um, and people whose calling is really to support other people. So social are the helpers. We'll go to the next line. So the next letter is E, which is enterprising. These are people who are really good at persuading other people. So they are leaders, they influence. If you think about um, any kind of military leaders, battalion commanders, anything like that, they are managing people. They are driving, providing direction. So they're really trying to influence a group of people. Um, lawyers would be another good example. They're trying to persuade the court one way or another. So trying to convince people of something. Same with salespeople, um, even marketing. Um, chief executives are good examples of persuaders. So entrepreneurs as well. So someone who basically is trying to convince people um, of an idea or influence them somehow. These people tend to be very outgoing, very energetic, um, and very confident as you would want a leader to be. So enterprising means kind of managing people, leadership roles, um, and people who are influencers. So that's enterprising. And the last one I will talk about is conventional. So these people are the organizers, if you will. So this is sort of the opposite of artistic, what we already heard Elizabeth talk about. So whereas artistic people like things that maybe are fluid and free flowing and don't have maybe a specific order of process, conventional would be just the opposite. So um, people who are drawn to conventional roles like things that are very clear, very structured, have processes in place. Um, they adhere to rules. Um, it might be someone who's in a record keeping type of role, secretary role. Um, accountants are a good example because obviously you want someone who's very detail oriented and adheres to those specific financial requirements. So conventional are the organizers, but also really adhered to a structured and orderly process. Um, people in compliance are another great example. So following um, regulations and set of rules. So these are the organizers, your conventional type. Over awesome. to you, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you, Paige. And my apologies, you guys. I don't know what's going on with my mouse. So I'm going to be hands off a little bit. So <laughs> it'll calm down. All right. Thank you, Paige. Okay, so let's take a look. You guys uh, responded, many of you responded as to which bucket you think the Honorable Ventress Gibson falls into, the director of the U.S. Mint. I'm going to share our results. Um, so we have a lot of folks guessing um, enterprising. That's the leading one at the moment. Uh, and then followed by conventional. So we could actually kind of debate that a little bit. Um, if you put enterprising, you're not wrong. If you put conventional, you're not wrong. Let's be honest. She's probably also social. So um, I'm going to jump over. We have Malayla, who's an educator advocate. She's an example of the social bucket. She works with um, girls in Pakistan to get them into education. Uh, President Barack Obama is enterprising, and he is able to uh, use a lot of his different uh, personalities in his work, but enterprising would be one of the main ones. And then the Honorable Ventress Gibson is the director of U.S. Mint. And she's listed here as conventional, but again, she really could be enterprising as well. Um, and conventional, are, those are the organizers, as Paige has mentioned. So, you know, when we start thinking through primary Holland codes, we all kind of have a little bit of our personalities, probably, that fall across all six areas, but we may have areas that we're the most dominant in. And that's what we're looking for. We start talking through career choice. So what do you guys think is the most common um, Holland code among service members, the words, I'm sorry, among service members across all branches. What do you think is the most common Holland type among all service members across all branches? So if we look at the entire U.S. military, what would be your guess? Um, and so let's jump over. We've got 
some votes coming in right now. Um, I'm gonna give you guys just a moment to respond. Um, see a lead right now for realistic. We've got some folks who are saying enterprising. What do you think is the most common Holland type across all service members, across all branches? So if you said enterprising, you would be correct. These are our persuaders and our leaders. Um, we can talk through that a little bit more, but it's kind of fun just to kind of explore and see what are the most prevalent among service members. Uh, enterprising takes the lead, but it's closely followed by investigative. Um, so again, our enterprising, these are folks who were influential. Their goal, if you remember back to uh, what Paige just, just spoke about, one of their goals is to, um, achieve a, is to achieve a goal, to work together for an organization to achieve a goal. Investigative, these are people who are looking to, to ask questions, they're math and science oriented, and then social, of course, being a part of a team, working with a part of a group. So um, great guesses coming in, realistic being hands-on. We definitely have a lot of service members who fall into that bucket as well. So um, when we look through the uh, using Holland in those counseling conversations, let's dive right in. When we look through using Holland in counseling conversations, um, it's really becomes a tool for your toolkit. So I'm gonna jump over here. When we talk through Holland types, so we just looked at six different Holland types. Now we can put those types together to create a code. What's the difference? Well, a type is social or realistic, whatever it may be. But a code is, um, uh, excuse me, a code is when we put together those different pieces. It's a combination of those six. So for this particular service member, their hauling code is ECS, um, enterprising, conventional, and social. And so if we look at this graph, you can see that enterprising is the highest. That's their highest area. So they are most interested in being in a leadership position or in a position where they can uh, work with others to influence and persuade. Um, but then they also have an interest in working with people and being conventional. When we look at the CES on this uh, kind of spider graphic, that's what I call it, Paige, I'm sure there's a technical term, but it reminds me of a spider web. When we look at the CES on this spider graphic, these are what we consider our really social areas. And this particular individual falls across all three. So they need to be in a position where they're working with people, okay? Um, same with this one. We have uh, uh, this individual, their code is SEC. So when you are working with a service member, one of the first things to do is to identify their code. So SEC, this is social, enterprising, and conventional. Note those high areas of interest. So for this particular area or this particular individual, their highest area is social. So they really do need to be in a position where they're working with people. It could be as a part of a team, it could be working with customers, but they need to be working with people. We also can um, look at some of those other areas. So we can see that they're also inter interested in enterprising and conventional, but do note those highest areas. And so that's why those are circled. One thing to consider is, and your experience may be a little bit different, but what I found in working with um, students and adults, they often had never seen this type of information before they took the assessment. So categorizing themselves as social or as enterprising, that was new. That was a new set of vocabulary for them. And so one of the things that we can do in this situation is set the stage. So with that being said, it really is important to remind service members, this is not a diagnosis. We are not prescribing them with a certain career personality. We are not diagnosing them with anything. We are giving them something to consider. This is a hypothesis. Based on the way you answer these questions, based on your mindset at the moment, um, this is what you are trending towards. This is what we're seeing. But one of the best things that service members can do is check it against what they know about themselves and what their friends and family members say about them. So they might think, look at this and say, you know, this really confirms what I think I know about myself. Or, no, this is very different than what I would have thought. And so that creates space to start talking it through. So there's some really great questions that you can start asking. Um, what kinds of things have you done like this in the past? Uh, how does this fit with what friends and family members say about you? Um, one of the things that I am providing to you guys 
is a set of cards that outline the career personalities for each of the six buckets. So let's say that I'm sitting down with you this morning and you are giving me the CUDA career interest assessment, or maybe I took it before I met with you, but I'm meeting with you to discuss my results. And let's say one of my high interest areas is realistic. If you were to provide this card to me during our counseling time, and you guys will have a, an electronic copy of all of these. Um, if you were to provide this card to me, this creates some talking points that you and I can discuss. So I could look at this and say, you know, I really am a hands-on person. I really am very practically minded. I, I like to be very practical in my thinking. It really matters to me when things, you know, when people let property break, when I don't take good care of property, it bothers me when things rest and stuff like that. Um, I do value knowing how to use a tool well. So, I mean, I can talk through these. We can discuss these together to say, what of this sounds like me and what I know about myself? What about this doesn't sound like me or surprises me? Um, so you guys will have all six of these cards that you can grab and utilize with service members as they are processing what their uh, realistic, what their Holland code is, okay? Now, the other document that we are providing to you is a handout that goes over discussing assessment results. So Paige, I'm gonna turn this over to you to talk through discussing the assessment results with service members. Yeah, Mariva, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Um, can we go back just a little bit yes. to look at those cards? Yes. I'm going to pull is these. super, super handy. Absolutely. Elizabeth, this is handy. So these will be made available to our um, participants just through the slide deck. Everyone will have access to them. Yes. I'll send them as a separate document. So if you guys wanna print them off really easily or just pull it up on your screen or even email it to a service member, would that be helpful? Absolutely. I really appreciate this additional tool that can be used. Um, and even as counselors, you know, we have to get our minds into the right mindset and make sure that we're keeping with the, with the, uh, the parameters of what's being you just said, you know, prescribe things to people. And I just want to use that word, but I'm not <laughs> recommended. Um, yes. But I just want to a foot stump that that is a huge asset. And I think our counselors will find it uh, helpful and something else they can add to their toolkit. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mariva. Yeah. Thank you so much. So the other thing that we or addition in addition, not other, but the additional thing that we're going to include is this discussion. So um, it's going to be titled Discussing Assessment Results, and you guys will have this document. So I'm going to pause right here and turn it over to Paige to talk through a little bit about this. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. So a lot of times people will come to us and say, you know, well, once someone has taken the assessment, what next? How do I support the individual? Um, and so that's what this document is, is providing you some, some guidance as to how do you actually interpret this, these results. Um, as Elizabeth said, you want to be cautious about prescribing and saying, you are this. Um, what you would want to do instead is, you know, ask for the um, service member to reflect on the results. Um, you know, it might um, validate something that they already know about themselves. They might say, oh my gosh, yes, I am very... Um, enterprising, I really like managing people, providing direction, or it might expose them to areas that they didn't know they had, so strengths or um, traits that they didn't realize and say, oh yeah, actually, I, I do like things very structured and very organized. Um, I didn't really realize that before. I wouldn't have said I was conventional, but um, you know, this has kind of opened my eyes and I want to explore this a bit more. So as Elizabeth said, the objective is really to um, create space for them to talk through and discuss and to hear their reflections and thoughts. Um, this, these sample questions here that you're seeing on number three kind of provide you some guidance as to where do you take it from here. And, and as Elizabeth already said, you know, you could ask things like, what kind of things like this have you done in the past year? This is a nice one to get them thinking practically. So if, if their results come back and it says, you know, their dominant trait is social. Ask them to reflect, well, what sort of things have you done that 
you know, you've really been able to help people with over the last year or so. And this might really help when they're thinking about if they're thinking about transitioning out of military into the civilian world is making those connections. So if they can say, oh, yes, in my role um, in the military, I support my troops by doing this. Um, and then you can take that answer and kind of get them to start thinking about well, what might that look like in the civilian world? Let's talk a little bit about that. If helping people is something you enjoy doing and something that you're interested in, let's explore what helping careers or occupations might look like in the civilian side of things. So again, these are just some sample questions to ask. You don't need to go through all of them. It is really up to you, we'll allow you all flexibility. Again, we don't want to prescribe, but I do find that it's helpful to have in your toolkit some questions that creates that dialogue with the service member that you're working with. So I won't go through all of those, but just to kind of give you thoughts and ideas around how to utilize these questions and really the, the purpose of, you know, once you've they've taken the assessment, how you interpret it and how you create that space to make those connections between what they gravitate towards and what that might look like maybe in the civilian world. Amazing. Paige, thank you so much. And we're getting lots of uh, hand clapping. People are appreciating this. Um, so thanks, you guys. Appreciate your feedback as well. Um, so then when we look at uh, talking through those coaching conversations, asking them those questions, um, just want to kind of give you a couple of last pieces. So I, when I go through a coaching session, I tend to have some big buckets that in my mind, okay, let's make sure we hit these things to keep the, the conversation progressing. So just to recap really quickly, what is their Holland code? That's kind of the first thing, right? So what is their Holland code? Um, for this individual, it's RCI. So we know that's realistic, conventional, investigative. What does that stand for? So again, realistic, conventional, investigative. What are some of the traits giving them those cards. And then what are some common related occupations? So this is where it can get a little tricky, right? Um, they may look at this and go, it's telling me to be a fill in the blank. And I don't want to be a fill in the blank, you know? So I'm going to give you some tools in just a second in the, in the journey system to support exploring occupations. But I want to go ahead and move us into our case study. And then we'll go back, then we'll circle back to exploring occupations around this. Okay. So here is our case study for this morning. So hopefully you guys can see this on the screen. If you can't, let me know and, and we can, somebody from our team, we can throw it in the chat, okay? All right, so here's our case study. Jennifer schedules an appointment with you. She is a senior enlisted member of the military who plans to transition from the military in the next 18 months. She has an idea of the career path she wants to pursue outside of the military but she wants to ensure she's reviewing all of her options around going back to school, et cetera. She has completed an interest assessment that shows her code is SEC. We know that stands for social, enterprising, and conventional. This is her first time seeing her Holland results. She is skeptical of the suggested occupations. So the first polling question, and we're gonna go ahead and launch this polling question, the first polling question, if you'll take some time to respond to, what would be your main goals for this meeting with Jennifer? So you've got some options to choose from, um, but what do you think are your main goals for this meeting? Just when you're kind of thinking through, okay, yes, we're gonna have this dialogue, but what it, what's the outcome we're looking for here? So what are your main goals going into this meeting? The reason I put that up there is, it's always important um, to, to kind of know what you want the outcome to be. And it might even be helpful to have, to talk that over with Jennifer at the beginning of the meeting. Um, Paige, do you wanna share anything about that? Um, kind of establishing those goals just real quickly. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm sure you all already do this, but um, usually in a one-on-one -on -one session, it's always a good idea to establish what it is they want to achieve at the end of the session. Um, and then you kind of maybe can guide them and say, you know, here's what we'll be able to do today. How does that sound for you? Um, I know sometimes people might come and say, okay, I want you to help me find a job by the end of the session, figure out what I should do, all of that. Um, and I like to make sure that they know that 
it's an ongoing process. It might take some time, um, but what we can do at the end of this session is maybe identify potential occupations to explore. And then, you know, they can come back for another session and you can discuss what they found and what their thoughts are and take it kind of step by step. So really setting those expectations um, and guiding them to, you know, achieving the goal, but putting it in a structured approach. Awesome. Thanks, Paige. Um, and I, I really appreciate how uh, the value in articulating it back to the service members. And you guys have already responded. I'm sharing those results about what you guys are thinking the goal would be. For a lot of you, it was to identify her Holland code and what her code means, um, followed by finding occupations and educational opportunities. So that leads us to our next question. How would you use her Holland code? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. Let me go ahead and end this really quickly. Um, the next polling question is, how would you use her Holland code to support Jennifer with career planning? Um, so go ahead and respond. You have an open space that you can just type. Um, go ahead and respond. How would you use her Holland code to support Jennifer with career planning? Mariba, do we have some folks who want to respond? uh on the call today to that question sure um javonda curry you are off mute if you'd like to go ahead and respond thanks mariba thanks javonda uh -huh. yeah there you are hello okay guy hi um i guess um i'm thinking along the lines of identifying find careers that may match um, what her assessment is. I mean, because for one, if she's not like a real sociable person, that may not be the best fit um, career job for her. So I'm thinking along the lines of identifying careers that match um, her personality. Nice. That's such a great point. And that's a really great segue, Javonda, because just a second, I'm going to show you guys how to identify careers that might resonate with her more if she is incredibly skeptical or even help her build confidence in that Holland code. So thank you. Appreciate the Javonda. Thank you. And we've got several folks who responded. So thank y'all. And then we're going to go to our last question. What types of questions would you ask her? So what would you ask Jennifer? She's come to you. You've taken the, um, the assessments. She's a little skeptical of that code that she's gotten. Um, what would be your questions for Jennifer around um, uh, taking the, uh, now that she's skeptical and, you know, just processing everything. So what types of questions would you have for the service member? So Mariba, do we have anybody else who uh, would like to respond? Sure. Yeah. Sure. We have a couple more people that are available and uh, that are off mute. Um, Marie is off mute. If you'd like to talk, Gina as well. Jeremy Hall, if you'd like, uh, Jeremy Lee, I'm sorry, if you'd like to add your input audibly, you all are off mute. Don't be shy, we're a family in here, come on. Yeah. Thanks, Raven. <laughs> and I know, Javonda did such a good job, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like folks are also responding to the polling question. And if you guys want to post in the chat, you can do that as well. Um, okay. Thinking through what kinds of questions you would ask. How about what is her time frame to accomplish her goals? Oh, I like that. That's, yeah. That's yeah. right, Javonda, because you know the common occurrences, I'm getting out in six months, what do I do? <laughs> A realistic goal, set some realistic goals and spot out, time it out for them. Absolutely. Um, when you guys run into this particular scenario, if you've run into this scenario before, or if you're thinking through what you would do, um, is there anything in particular that you have learned that you kind of go to when you're working with uh, service members in this particular situation? If you have some kind of expertise around that that you have uh, that you want to share, we'd appreciate it. You're welcome to post that in the chat or you can unmute if you have audio capabilities. Um, and Mariva, is there anything else that you would add about this particular counseling session? Um, I think the 
the most um, the most critical thing that we can do is to be realistic in setting that timeline that J Javonda just pointed out because people start feeling a pressure to do mm -hmm. something. And sometimes that translates into them doing anything. And that's not always helpful. So just to try to make sure that we're realistic in capturing a timeline for them and to make certain that they know that they're not late for anything, they're right on time. This is just in keeping with getting yeah. the next chapter of their lives on track. That's such a great point. I love that statement. You're not late for anything. You're right on time. Um, Elizabeth, can I jump in yeah, for a second? Please do, okay. yeah. Yeah. I wanted to, while everyone's kind of, you know, thinking about this last question, question three, you know, what kinds of questions would you ask her? Um, one, one tip that's relatively simple, but I think really powerful is um, just being mindful of the question words you use. So if we look at this case study and she says, you know, Jennifer is skeptical of her suggested occupations. I always caution everyone to avoid using the word why, the question word why. If we were to say, well, why are you skeptical? It puts that person on the defensive and it doesn't have a good feeling. If you just simply change the why from why to tell me a little bit about your thoughts, you know, um, what's the rationale, you know, um, just tell me about um, what has led you to be skeptical about this. Just in changing the tone of those questions, you get the same information, but it doesn't put that person on the defensive. So you're just kind of asking them, hey, it's okay to be skeptical. Let's talk about that. You know, um, which occupations are you most skeptical about? Tell me, um, you know, a little bit around your thoughts for that. So just in how you word your question, it can have a big impact on working with your service members. Wow, such a great point. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we are going to keep moving, but we'll come back to this in just a little bit. Um, and as we are looking at individual service members assessment results, I want to give you some scenarios that can happen. Sometimes you'll get a service member that has a high score in all six areas. So there's six buckets. They're interested in everything. What do you do? That's overwhelming, right? There's over a thousand different occupations in the United States no one's interested in all a thousand, right? That would be a lot. So how do we, how do we work with those individuals who do not have a defined interest? They're interested in everything. Um, well, one thing that, that you can do in that situation is really um, give them space to have that discussion. So the questions that you guys are, ask, are asking those clients, the space to just talk it through, um, that can give them some good frames of reference to say, I do have a lot of different in, different areas of interest, but I'm really kind of what I hear from family and friends, what I kind of know about myself is I'm more social. And so that can help give them some more definition. Let's go the other direction. Let's say they don't have defined interest. So they're not really interested in every in anything. So we went from we're interested in all of it to we're not really interested in any of it. Why does that even happen? Um, my background's in human development. So I, I do have a tendency to, to be very curious about how we got to where we are today. Um, so in that situation, if you're like me and you're curious, that can come from a variety of things. Maybe there wasn't a lot of opportunity in their childhood to establish interest. That can happen, unfortunately. Um, it could be that later in life, they were discouraged or they had some kind of event happen that it just really kind of you know, killed them having the opportunity to, to explore and consider what was right for them. So when you meet with individuals who have a low score in all six areas, there's still plenty of opportunity. The key action for them, and this is important, the key action is that they engage in career exploration. That is going to be critical and it could look a lot of different ways. They can get on their account and they can explore, they can talk to people, that, that would be a great person to try to set up some kind of um, mentoring or job shadowing or something like that. And, you know, we can absolutely talk that through, but it was going to be really important that they do some career exploration. So um, even just starting with watching the videos and reading about careers in Cooter, that's a great starting point. So just some things to go in your toolkit as you're meeting with different individuals. Um, 
let's see. Marie said, I would ask Jennifer to look into her current career and ask her to identify some of the traits. Marie, that is a fantastic uh, next step and action item. And we are going to jump right over and do that because I want to show you guys where to find that. So I'm going to jump over to the uh, Compu uh, Cooter Journey system. And I posted at the beginning of the session a username and password. Um, if somebody from uh, the team could repost that, that would be very helpful in the chat. I'd appreciate it. So it's journey.cooter.com. Um, we can throw the web address in the chat journey.cooter.com. The username and the password are already posted to the chat and we'll repost it. When you log in, when your service members log in, this is a really great spot to do that career exploration and to Marie's point. Thank you, Erin. And to Marie's point, um, let's look at that current career and identify some traits and then go find jobs with similar traits, right? So there's two different ways to do it. I'm going to start with the one that Marie suggested. So when I come over here to explore occupations, look at all the different ways we can explore occupations. We're gonna to go to military specialty. So Jennifer has a lot of military experience. Um, she might have 16 years of service. And so tapping into her current interests and abilities in her current military position can help us moving forward. So I'm gonna come over here and you can put in a code and you, many of you have may have seen this before where you can put in a military code, but I'm not sure that, um, that everybody knows what else you can do. You can also type in a skill. So if there's a skill set from your current military position, you can even indicate the branch, but I'm just gonna say any branch for the moment. I'm gonna type in mechanical. And when I click search, it's going to populate different jobs connected to that military um, term or skill or however you wanna classify this right here, mechanical. So these are civilian occupations. So if we look at mechanical um, abilities and mechanical positions in the military, it's going to generate a list of civilian occupations. And if I open any one of these, it's going to show me similar military positions. Is this helpful? Is this something um, that, that you guys could use with your service members? So basically you go search for a current skill in the military that they are utilizing. It'll pull up a civilian position and then they can also see the military positions. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm glad to know oh, this yeah. is helpful. Oh yeah, go ahead, Mariba. Yes, indeed, that is very helpful because um, it, it can be difficult sometimes to find, you, you know, to use language interchangeably with the way we would use it yeah. in the military and the civilian sector. So this is very good, with helping our service members build their vocabulary as yeah. they're going forward, seeking out new careers. Awesome, Mariba, thank you. Um, and then just as a reminder, any of these civilian occupations, you can open this up and the service member can review that particular civilian occupation. Um, they can read through and watch the video. So remember watching our videos is gonna be critical for, I mean, really everybody, but especially those who don't have that defined interest yet um, and then reading about it. And what I appreciate about the journey, the journey system is we always go full circle. So I can go to any occupation and look at the related career personalities. So th in this scenario, I went to an actual position, a civilian occupation, and I looked at the career personalities for that civilian occupation. So for this one, it's investigative and it's realistic and I can read about what that means. Now, the other piece is searching for careers around a Holland code. So let's go back to our friend, Jennifer, um, who is able to, uh, let's go back to our friend Jennifer, who is who you were working with, our service member, and she's skeptical of that code, okay? So I can come over here and I can actually type in a code. So let's say Jennifer says, you know what? I am incredibly social. I'm not so sure about this convention, conventional piece. I'm not even sure about enterprising, but I am very social. So we can just type in social. She could indicate the level of education she's interested in, or she could just say, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to go with everything for the moment and search by all, but I'm going to say a master's degree. So social master's degree might be her goal. And when I click apply, it's going to show me all the different jobs that are social and I can sort. I love the sorting feature. So the first one it pulls up is a career counselor. Um, and that is very much a social position. 
Um, but when I scroll down, we can see all these different jobs. There's 64. Um, and she can actually start to look through this and just kind of get an idea. Or she can get more specific. So I'm going to say, let's just go ahead and look at her code. It was social, enterprising, and conventional. When I click apply, um, I'm going to see jobs that are social, enterprising, and conventional. Notice again, I can sort. So we can play with that filter too. If you're like me, you may be wondering, does the order matter? It does, but also when we're learning about ourselves, it's okay to, to look at jobs that may be a little out of order too. So um, it just might mean, you know, which area is most prevalent for them, which they have the strongest or highest interest in. Okay. So I wanna pause right here. What kinds of questions do we have? Um, let's see, Tom said, uh, he brought up about the Army Cool program, which is very cool. Had not, I was not familiar with that. Um, Mariba, do you uh, are you familiar with the Army Cool program? Yes, ma'am, I am. So the various branches have um, cool programs where uh, service members. Mariba, you keep going in and out about getting a non-traditional training, um, like an apprenticeship or things of that nature. It's enough from each specific branch. Nice. Hear me, Elizabeth? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Thank about you. about the Army Cool Program? Yes. Yes. Copy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, um, for sure. And Tom, thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, and um, so I'm gonna come over here. The last thing that I wanna show you in the journey system before you move on is when service members are exploring, and this is really critical in several different ways. When service members are exploring different careers, let's say that I look through this and I get very excited about a clinical nurse specialist. So maybe this is a job that fits my, my um, interest areas and I've read through it. I've watched the video, I have read about the career personality and I'm thinking, this is it, this is what I wanna do. I need to save it. So any career that I am either really excited about or I'm thinking that might be something I wanna learn more about, I need to save this occupation. So when you're meeting with service members, if you'll encourage them to do that, and here's why, um, it's dropping breadcrumbs through the system so that they don't have to go, uh, what was that job again? You know, They don't have to go find these again. Um, all of the careers that they have an interest in or they think sound like something they wanna pursue, those are gonna go into their favorites folder. And so from here, we have a list of their favorite occupations. We have a list of their favorite Holland work environments. Um, they can even save colleges and majors and all that kind of great stuff. That's, a, that's another webinar, another training, right? When we start talking through college search. But this is gonna give a list of the favorite jobs. Now, when you sit down with that service member, you have a list to discuss and service members can even rank these. So if this week I'm feeling very excited about mechanical engineering, I can throw that on the top of the list. And this is just a really nice space to start to sort jobs. Um, Maribit has shared before about, you know, it can be challenging to, um, to make sense of all these different occupations that are out there. And I so appreciate that truth, Mariba. Um, to me, this is a nice tool to help support that. And I hope that, that you'll find it helpful as well with your service members um, to get a list of jobs and have some talking points right here. Yeah, thanks, Javonda. I appreciate that. And this, uh, um, Anicia, excuse me, I, I don't want to pronounce your name. Anicia asked, is there an organization access code and password we can use for registration? Um, Marie, but do we still, we still want to direct those, uh, those questions to our team, right, to provide the access codes and passwords? Does that sound like the plan? Yes, definitely. Uh, Anicia, um, I will send you a message right now. Just respond to that and I will forward it over to our, our team at Cooter. They'll provide your login and access code for you. Nice. Thanks, Mariba. All right, you guys. So last pieces before we wrap for this morning. Um, any other questions that you all have or any other um, uh, you know, questions that you've run into from service members that were complex or you were just really at a loss of, I don't know how to answer that, or maybe you wanted some more direction on how to answer. 
If you'll post those in the chat, we want to talk those through before we wrap for this morning. Anything else you run into with service members when it comes to discussing hauling codes, pieces that you want to be aware of. Um, I'm going to jump over to our slide deck and we're going to wrap up for this morning. But any other questions you hear from service members that you would like to, uh, to pose here, we're here to talk about them. So throw those in the chat. We'll take a look. I'm going to grab this really quickly. So goals of career advising, absolutely going over the code. And um, I always uh, tend to lead, this is me personally, I always tend to lean, lean towards when I'm working with an individual that assuming that this is the first time they're seeing their Holland codes. Um, and so really taking the time to educate them on what those codes mean. Um, and you'll have the resources to do that. And then finding the programs of study, that would be another goal. Um, and we've talked through that as well. And then identifying those occupations. And so that's where Journey can help with both identifying occupations and finding programs of study. So last piece for this morning are examples of some Holland codes that we have found are common upon uh, among uh, military uh, service members, excuse me. So when we look at our, uh, our list of, of common Holland codes, um, one of the ones that we often see among our service members is SEC. Um, I'm in, since I'm in Alabama, my mind goes to football, right? Um, but we are not talking about the Southeastern Conference for football, for college football. We are talking about Holland Code. So SEC, uh, Social, Enterprising, and Conventional. So uh, obviously being very team oriented, being, uh, you know, seeing oneself as a leader, and then also conventional, liking structure and organization. Um, but when I come over here, we can see that social, I want to just, ooh, excuse me just a second. I want to walk you through um, looking at these results. So again, utilizing the bar graphs, and this is where it can be helpful to talk it through with service members, utilizing those bar graphs, social is the highest. Um, so really making sure that when we talk about career fields, social is going to be important. And then um, E and C also being the other high interest areas. So again, on that spider web, they're really leaning towards occupations that are working with people. Let's compare that to RCI. This is another common Holland code among our service members. It's in the top 10 of different Holland codes among service members. This particular individual, their highest area is R. And you can see that on the bar graph. On the spider web, you can see that it really pulls towards R, towards realistic. And many of you guessed this morning that that would be the most common Holland type among service members. And so really um, getting familiar with different realistic careers might be a helpful piece to, uh, to be more comfortable talking about realistic careers. So you may wanna spend some time researching realistic careers in the Cooter system. And remember, you can jump over, type in the letter R where we just were and look at all those different realistic careers. And then the last one would be um, ECS. So enterprising on that spider web, it's really pulling towards enter enterprising and then followed by social and conventional or conventional and social. Um, this is where helping service members interpret those assessment results can be helpful because it gives them a language to define themselves. Um, one piece that can be really challenging when we're talking about choosing career is finding the language to talk about what we wanna do. And so one of the things that I appreciate about Holland is it gives us a language. So when I start thinking about my career choices, um, even if I don't use definitive I am a or I work for, um, I can talk about my personality. So I am incredibly social. I, I, I will share that with you guys. I'm incredibly social. And um, I, it's important to me to work with people that matters to me. And so I can come over here and explore social careers. But if there's a particular code that you just don't feel as comfortable with, you're like, I just don't know as much about that code. I would really encourage you to spend some time in the system, come over here to occupations related to a Holland code and do some research on that code. So I'm gonna come over here to realistic, click apply, and I'm gonna to start to kind of build my, um, my, my bank of what are realistic careers. When I think about realistic careers, what are some examples of that? Well, under the realistic bucket, we're gonna find green jobs. And I know that because our key indicates a green leaf means it's a job that promotes a green economy. I can actually look at all education levels and that's gonna give me a really nice full list 
of green, of, excuse me, realistic careers. And you can see a lot of them, most of them are going to be related to that hands-on work, okay? All right, 